So welcome everybody. Um, I'm Reverend Stephen Milton, and today we are doing a session on call on baptism. Baptized for what is the title of this one? And the reason I decided to call it that was that uh, the meaning of baptism has changed over and over again. Um, it's it's rarely clear why. Well, people get baptized for very clear reasons, and they are even willing to kill each other over it. Um, so we're going to get into why that's been over the uh, over the years. Um, just as a quick kind of uh, start to this, though, I'm just curious: how many people were baptized as babies here? Just put your hand up. Okay. Anybody baptized as an adult? Uh, yep. Jim and Mary. Cool. Oh, and Bonnie. Well done. And Toby. All right, and then Louise, all right. Well, almost like half and half, that's very cool. All right, great. Um, Mary, do you have a question or is it just because you raised your hand that your hand up thing is on? Yeah, okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, so we're gonna, this one's gonna be a little bit different. Usually I sort of stick to the Bible and we just explore one Bible story. This time we're gonna start with a Bible story, which is literally, you know, the baptism of Jesus. And then we're going to look at how that story and how it's applied to Christians afterwards has been interpreted over 2000 years. Okay. Because you, some of you remember your baptism, others don't, but we've all seen lots of baptisms. So we know what baptism means now more or less, and we can talk about that, but it's gone through a lot of interpretations over the years. And what's interesting is when you look at baptism, you're really looking at what the meaning of Christianity is it's about who's in who's out when are you christian enough to be baptized does that matter those sorts of issues um so we'll see as we go as we unpack this so just as some background um the jews did baptize people uh but they baptized themselves like uh people were expected to ritually purify themselves by washing themselves in water before going to the temple for instance and after maybe coming back from warfare, that kind of thing. So baptism, self-baptism was a thing. But um, uh, the only people who baptized somebody else would be parents or priests would baptize children when they were too young to baptize themselves, like to wash themselves off. Otherwise, it was a self-serve kind of deal. So um, when John the Baptist showed up uh, in the Jordan River baptizing people, that was a departure. That was strange. So um, to get into that, why don't we start by just reading a famous passage from the Gospel of Mark. Um, gospel of Mark is the earliest gospel written. So it was written around the year 70 or so. Um, so you're really sort of at ground zero here. And what's interesting about the Gospel of Mark is that it starts with John the Baptist and Jesus. There's nothing before that in Mark. There's no nativity story, no Christmas story, just boom. As far as Mark is concerned, the Jesus story starts with baptism. So why don't we start there too? So we'll need six readers for this. And for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, we all take turns reading um, and sort of one person reads the slide and the next person. So I need six people to volunteer to read a slide. So okay, Laura, Mary, Vicky, okay, one sec. Laura, Mary, Vicky, Jocelyn. Uh, who else? Linda, great. Toby, okay. And that's six, great. And I'll just call it your name so you don't have to remember um, what order to go in. Okay, so I'm just knock you guys over there. Oop. Right, okay. So, and of course, you'll have to unmute yourself for this to work. So, uh, Laura, if you could start by reading this, please. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Great. Thank you. And Mary, if you could read this page, please. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins 
They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Great, thank you. And Vicki, if you could go next, please. And so John, sorry, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts, locusts and wild honey. Great, thank you. Um, and Jocelyn, if you could go next, please. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Great, thank you. And Linda, if you could go next, please. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Thank you. And Toby, if you could do this one, please. Just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, any first reactions to that? You've probably heard this passage lots of times. Um, anything come to mind as you hear that? Let me ask you a question. Is there a difference between the kind of baptism that John was doing to people in the Jordan and the kind of baptism that he says Jesus will be able to do? Yes, but he does say that it's to have <laughs> baptize you to repent of your sins. And is he saying Jesus must repent of his sins? Yeah, good question, right? Because John is explicitly saying, I'm baptizing people who are willing to repent of their sins, right? You're going to wash those sins right out of your hair, right? You're going to get that stuff off of you. Um, and then Jesus lines up to be baptized. And is Jesus considered to be someone who has sinned? Not so, at least not in Mark's words. Yeah, right. I mean, Jesus, by definition, is sinless. That's kind of mm -hmm. the operating assumption of all the Gospels. Uh, Jim? Does repentance in its original point a Greek mean repentance, or does it mean changing one's thought and direction yeah, or something other? Yeah, it means a change of mind, um, which, uh, so it doesn't just mean feeling sorry, although that would be part of a change of mind, I guess. It would also be um, a willingness to live in a different way, right? So you would live closer to the will of the will and way of God rather than further away from it. But just the same, Jesus is the will and way of God, right? So um, Jesus lining up to be baptized uh, can be seen as an act of extreme humility, right? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of starts there, right there. You know, Jesus doesn't walk in and say, I'm the guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> instead he gets in line he gets in line and he's and he's baptized right so from the very get-go this idea that the last will be first and the first will be last is right there it's happening right there at the baptism bonnie and no, i was i was going to say it shows his whole ministry of submission yeah yeah exactly yeah it's it's right there at the very beginning now is there, is there uh I guess there is speculation, at least, that uh, Jesus was, in a way, part of John the Baptist's uh, inner circle at one point, was he not? Yeah, they seem to know each other very well. Of course, in the Gospel of Luke, it says that they're cousins, mm -hmm. right? being known to each other. Um, and uh, certainly their followers are sort of fellow travelers with each other. And some of John's disciples come over to be with Jesus after John gets arrested. So yeah, there's a fair bit of fluidity in there, but something kind of spectacular happens during Jesus's baptism. It doesn't happen when John does them. What is that? God speaks. God speaks and something happens to Jesus um, as he comes out of the water. Confirmed by God the Father. 
Yeah. Oh, the dub, dub descends, right? right. Dub descends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the whole show comes. the chosen one. Right. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove in the, in the likeness of a dove. It's not saying there's a real bird there. Um, and uh, enters into Jesus. Um, and at the same time, God is saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. So it's a declaration literally from heaven. This is the guy, this is the one I have sent. And he is infused with the Holy Spirit. So if you've ever wondered why during a baptism, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's because the Christian Christian witness is that that's how Jesus's ministry started, where the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit were all together at once as Jesus came out of the water. Okay. So John's baptism uh, has been one of washing away sins, preparing the way for the Messiah, the anointed one, but, um, Jesus, but he doesn't have the power to confer the Holy Spirit on people. That's just not something power to do, whereas Jesus does have that power. Um, and it starts with him getting the power within him. Um, and so you can see John as a sort of last gasp of the old order, right? where in the Jewish order, one sins, and then you need to uh, be cleansed of that sin. And that happens through washing your body, but also going to the temple to make sacrifices. In the Christian dispen dispensation, Jesus arrives, he gets baptized too, unnecessarily, but as we've said, it's sort of consistent with his, the humility of his, of his ministry. But the key thing is that he is now going to be able to give the Holy Spirit to others. And if you're looking for a sacrifice, take over from what the Jews have been doing, of course, it's Christ himself. Right? He's the one who will make the ultimate sacrifice on the cross. And that brings the age of sacrifice as a way of atoning for sins to, to an end with um, I was just when you said about um, John couldn't baptize with the Holy Spirit, but in the Psalms, David talks about and take not the, um, thy Holy Spirit from me. So that's where I find it confusing because didn't the people in the Old Testament also have the Holy Spirit? Um, well, you know, if you know your Psalms, they're constantly asking for the Holy Spirit to come, right? But um, like they're constantly beseeching God, my God, my God, why have you, you know, gone away? Why aren't you with me? Why am I suffering like this? Where are you? Don't you hear my pleas? Like there's a sense that God comes and goes, right, um, uh, in the Psalms. Whereas, uh, as we'll see, Christians believe that baptism is a way of getting the Holy Spirit to be with you all the time. Um, so stay tuned we will explore this as we go um so john's baptism story of jesus says that okay jesus gets the holy spirit in him but during the rest of the gospels jesus never like lays his hand on one of the disciples and gives them the holy spirit that's not what happens instead near the end of the gospels varying places depending which gospel you're reading he says i'm going to go away now i'm going to go back to the father but the Holy Spirit will be sent to you. And um, so let's read, uh, let's read the, um, oh yeah, so I wanna say one other thing. Um, the funny thing, well, I'm gonna skip that actually. Let's just go to where we get the Holy Spirit. So I need mm -hmm. five readers for this, for this next chunk. Uh, Linda, was your hand up? Linda, Jim? Yeah. Uh, this is Linda. Yeah. I just wanted to put forth this concept that I've had, I guess, since childhood, that the concept that we were all that we all have sins and that we were born with them and that we have to that there was something evil there that had to be gotten rid of right away. We will talk about that, too. Good. <laughs> just not yet, but I promise we will okay. definitely get to that because that becomes a big part of this. So you're not alone in feeling that. Or having heard that anyway. Um, okay, so Linda, Jim, Isla, two more, uh, two more readers. Uh, Sheila, great, thank you. Anybody else want to go in? And oh, and Louise, great, thanks. Okay, so one more sec. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, so we're in the book of Acts, and we're going to hear the Pentecost story. So, Linda, if you could start on this page, please. When, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Great. Thank you. Um, and Jim, if you could go next, please. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Great. Thank you, Ann. I love you could go next, please. I don't hear you, Isla, so you may need to unmute yourself. So I will start again. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Great, thank you. And Sheila, if you could go next, please. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. Right, thank you. And Anne Louise, if you go last, please. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the famous Pentecost story starts in the house, ends in the water. So what happens? What's what's the special thing that happens during Pentecost? The tongues of fire touching each one of the 11. And what are the tongues of fire? Why is that happening to them? It's supposed to be the Holy Spirit descending on them. Right. Is this the first indwelling of the Spirit as such? On the disciples it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as the Holy Spirit came to Jesus in baptism, the Holy Spirit comes to the disciples um, at this moment in Pentecost. Um, and Pentecost was an agricultural festival that happened 50 days after Passover. So there wasn't anything special about the day of Pentecost. Like it's not like we call it Pentecost because of the Holy Spirit coming on the disciples. Pentecost would have happened anyway. But Christians celebrate it because this is where the Holy Spirit goes into the disciples and it gives them the power um, to start baptizing other people um, through the Holy Spirit as well. 
and they will use the Holy Spirit to lay on hands as well as do healings and stuff. So now what had dwelt exclusively in Jesus before um, now is spreading through the disciples. And it, this becomes the way in which uh, the authority structure of the church got structured. Has someone who's had the Holy Spirit touched you? Right? That all breaks down eventually, but that's, that's how it starts out. So um, what do you have to do to get baptized on this day of this particular day? Go well, they, they walked into the river. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And uh, well, welcome the spirit. Yeah. I mean, th what happens, you know, like the, they all start speaking in tongues. The people mm -hmm. outside the house hear it. Goes, What's going on? Those guys don't know those languages. And then Peter makes a speech, right? And then it just says that people were convinced and he baptized thousands of people on that day. That was it. Bing, bang, boom. Like, whoa, this is so cool. Baptize me. And everybody heads off to the river and gets baptized. So it's sort of an instant baptism, right? And in the book of Acts, we see this a number of times. You remember the story about the Ethiopian, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, right? He's just minding his own business, reading Isaiah and his chariot and uh, Philip hears him reading it and says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, no, why don't you explain it to me? They have a chat. And before you know it, the Ethiopian's saying, hey, why can't I be baptized? And they just stop the chariot and they get baptized in a river. So baptism happens really, really quickly. It can happen on the same day that you meet a Christian, apparently, <laughs> according to this, right? And inclusively, it seems. Yes, very inclusively. Um, especially with the Ethiopian eunuch. I mean, that was a black tra transgendered person. You know, get someone whose gender is being changed, right? So, um, can I turn up my volume? Um, I'll just have to talk louder, I guess. If I can do that, um, it may be because I put my papers on top of the microphone. Is that any better? Mm -hmm. Fine. Yeah. Okay. I think it's just where my papers were. Um, so, the in Acts, people get baptized really, really quickly. You know, you meet a Christian, you say, wow, that sounds great, and you can get baptized. It doesn't seem to be much more complicated than that. Um, and Christians believe that a dramatic change happens in a person when they get baptized. Like the moment of baptism is a dramatic change to your personality, your worldview. You, you repent in the sense that Jim was talking about, where you have a massive change of mind. You just start seeing the world in a different way. And to get a sense of that, um, I'd like us to read uh, a passage from Paul from uh, the book of Romans. And for this, I just need two readers. Volunteers? Uh, Laura, thank you. Anything else you want to do? Okay, I'll do the other page. So Laura, can, you can go first. Um, pull it up. So just uh, for context here, uh, Acts, is probably written around the year 80. Um, Paul wrote his letter to the Romans in the 60s. So he's writing even earlier than Luke. Um, so this is a really early idea about how um, baptism works. Okay, Laura, if you could go first. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Thank you. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin 
and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, I bet that sounds perplexing. <laughs> the Especially if we were baptized as babies, how could we know enough to change? An issue we will address in full in this. That's, that's an issue which people will talk about a lot. The, weird, the other weird thing, right, is that Paul is talking about we as Christians have died to sin, right? We've gone through some sort of death. And what he's referring to is baptism. Because in the old days, like right at the beginning, he's writing in the year 60, they baptized in rivers and it had to be deep enough to drown in. Mm. Your baptism, which, you know, as we saw in Acts, happened to adults, not babies. Baptism was something that adults went through as a way of dying to their sinful life and coming out reborn to receive the Holy Spirit and to live a new life in Christ. So this is a dramatic turn in your life, like just the hardest left-hand turn you've ever taken. Um, and this death and rebirth imagery is what, by thinking that the baptism going under the water is your death and coming out is your rebirth, links you to Christ's death and resurrection. Toby? Well, I was interested that it said that Jesus can never die again because he's died once and death will have no dominion over him. Uh, when I die, I won't rise again and and uh, death will have no dominion over me, so I can't die again. So are we not in the same category? <laughs> well, what they mean is that uh, Jesus, having resurrected, can never die again. The idea is that he went up to heaven in bodily form. Like, he just can't die again. You know, that only happens <clears throat> once. And we, we biological beings, even if we're baptized, of course, we will biologically die. But the hope which comes with baptism is that we will be granted eternal life. So that we're, although our, we die biologically, we don't die eternally. And that was a big deal. That was a really big deal because the Romans believed that although emperors, uh, emperors could be deified, turned into gods and have eternal life, your average Joe would not. Your average Joe would die biologically and then their soul would go down to Hades where they would have a sort of shadowy existence, barely conscious. And, you know, they'd live in everlasting boredom. Like they didn't really live again. Whereas the Christians were saying, no, there's actually an eternal life which is offered to you if you dramatically change your ways. And the only way that can start is through baptism. But although in Acts, baptism can happen on the same day that you meet a Christian, that is not the way it works in, per in practice. In practice, uh, it became very complicated. Um, by the year 100 or so, <clears throat> If you wanted to become a Christian, they would insist that you spend about three years in training. Yeah, three years. No joke. Um, and uh, the idea was that they felt that Roman pagan society had so deeply infected people with a sinful way of thinking and doing and being and living that they needed to be thoroughly exorcised of those demonic influences. Now, the Romans themselves believed that they were constantly being subject to personal daemons as well as they wanted the influence of the gods in their lives. But from the Christian point of view, none of those gods existed, um, and at worst, they were demons. So you needed to be thoroughly purified, sort of on one level, like through exorcisms and fasting and prayer. And on the other level, you just needed to learn the story, you know, like they they went through a very long confirmation class, if you want to think of it that way. Like for three years, they needed to hear the scriptures and read them on their own and talk about them and start to understand that a life worth living was not a life which was utterly selfish. And uh, to give you an idea of what this was like, I mean, in, in everyday Roman, a, a typical day for a Roman, you'd be walking down the street all around you, there are statues of the emperor in every pub you go into, every restaurant you go into, every house you go into, every bathhouse you go into, every forum you go into. There's statues of the emperors, as well as the city's gods and the major gods, uh, like Athena and Mars and so forth. Not Athena, Venus and Mars. And if you went to a dinner party, you'd walk in the house, 
you would have to make a little offering of oil um, at the at the very front of the house basically as your as your shoes are being being taken off by the slave you would make some sort of oil uh, offering to the household god because you wouldn't want to offend the god of the household you don't want anything to go badly in the dinner party so you do that maybe you're bringing the meat or the host has the meat they will read the entrails of the meat before they cook it to make sure everything's okay that this dinner party is allowed to happen it's not going to offend the gods then they would cook the meat they make a little sacrifice for the gods like the gods were everywhere and you had to continually be propitiating them and for instance uh let's say you're a young man and you fall for a woman down the street you want her to fall in love with you but she's not paying any attention to you well there's an answer for that what you need to do is go get someone to cast a spell on her and so you pay good money to have someone cast a spell on her and you buy an mm -hmm. amulet the amulet would have her name on it, as well as maybe Venus's name. So you could get Venus's, um, uh, Venus's influence to try and get her to love you. And conversely, if you have a business, say you're in business, and you've got a competitor, you want your competitor to fail so you can get more of the market share, you would go to someone, a sorcerer, and get them to start sending curses that way, send some evil that way to your, uh, to your competitor. And you might buy uh, unctions for that or a more amulets. Like people wore grudges on their skin. And we know because they went to their graves with this stuff on them and find skeletons with amulets. And there were curses and graffiti and stuff on walls. This was a world permeated by um, uh, a belief in multiple gods, but also the belief that you could use the gods to get your will against other people. Okay. And of course, you had an emperor who believed in the power of force to keep everybody in line. And a nice Saturday was spent at the forum watching animals tear apart slaves and political prisoners. Right? Violence was just endemic in Roman society, not just at the front, but also on the streets. Murder was allowed. You could murder your slave. That's no problem. They're your property. It's like killing a cow. Not a big deal. You could rape your slave. Same thing property doesn't matter no one's gonna ask you could murder a man on the street and that's a problem if he's a freeborn man uh, but the worst that would happen to you is you would be exiled from the city there was no there weren't jails there weren't uh, not for murder anyway there was no capital punishment for murder you could get away with murder everybody could be Donald Trump on Fifth Avenue okay Christian said that's all horrible and corrupt <laughs> that's disgusting no one should be like that and in practice they didn't think you could be cured of that in a day in practice it took three years of deprogramming people mm -hmm. like it was a really really big deal before they'd allow you to get baptized because you didn't want to come with all those corrupt ideas into the christian family and you wouldn't be prepared to receive the holy spirit if you were that corrupt in your being We, we take for granted the effects of Christian ethics on Western civilization. It used to be a lot. It used to be really nasty and horrible here. Not here in Canada, but back there. So um, why don't we get a sense? So the big day would come. The big day would come for a baptism. And I'm going to have you guys read an account of what a baptism was like. Um, and they would have them on the night before Easter because you were dying to your old life and you were gonna be reborn into a new life. So what better day to do it than Easter? Mm -hmm. People would be expected to fast, a lot of prayers, a lot of exorcisms in that last week. And then Easter morning would arrive. So uh, can I get six readers for this one? Okay, Mary, Toby, Jocelyn, Vicki. Anybody else? Uh, Isla, great, thank you. Okay, oh, and Sheila, great, thank you. Okay, so this was written, um, so you know when this is happening. Uh, this was written around the year 215 by a guy called Hippolytus, and it just describes what they did on a typical Easter morning when they wanted to baptize people. Okay, so Mary, you're gonna go first. And, and Louise, does the sound better now? Yep, okay, great.
Okay, so go ahead, Mary. At the hour in which the cock crows, they shall first pray over the water. When they come to the water, the water shall be pure and flowing. That is, the water of a spring or a flowing body of water. Then they shall take off all their clothes. The children shall be baptized first. All of the children who can answer for themselves, let them answer. If there are any children who cannot answer for themselves, let their parents answer for them or someone else from their family. After this, the men will be baptized. Finally, the women, after they have unbound their hair and removed their jewelry. No one shall take any foreign object with themselves down into the water. Thank you. And Toby, if you could read this part, please. At the time determined for baptism, the bishop shall give thanks over some oil, which he puts in a vessel. It is called the oil of thanksgiving. He shall take some more oil and exercise it. It is called the oil of exorcism. A deacon shall hold the oil of exorcism and stand on the left. Another deacon shall hold the oil of thanksgiving and stand on the right. Thank you. And Jocelyn, you're next. When the elder takes hold of each of them who are to receive baptism, he shall tell each of them to renounce, saying, I renounce you, Satan, all your services and all your works. After he has said this, he shall anoint each with the oil of exorcism, saying, let every evil spirit depart from you. Great, thank you. And uh, Vicki, if you could read this part, please. Then after these things, the bishop passes each of them on nude to the elder who stands at the water. They shall stand in the water naked. A deacon, likewise, will go down with them into the water. When each of them to be baptized has gone down into the water, the one baptizing shall lay hands on each of them, asking, Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? And the one being baptized shall answer, I believe. Thank you. And Isla. He shall then baptize each one of them once, laying his hand upon each of their heads. Then he shall ask, Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and died, and rose on the third day, living from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and sat down on the right hand of the Father, the one coming to judge the living and the dead. Great, thank you. And Sheila, if you could do, do this page for you. When each of them answered, I believed, he shall baptize a second time. Then he shall ask, do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the flesh? Then each being baptized shall answer, I believe. And thus let him baptize the third time. Afterward, when they have come up out of the water, they shall be anointed by the elder with the oil of thanksgiving, saying, I anoint you with holy oil in the name of Jesus Christ. Then, drying themselves, they shall dress and afterwards gather in the church. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so <laughs> what do you make of that? Is that the kind of baptism you wish you'd had? <laughs> I find it kind of shocking, um, actually, that in that time, I know that the Romans had baths, but were the baths not segregated in terms of sex? Uh, yes, yeah, they were. So to me, would it not be shocking to actually disrobe in front of a group of people who you don't necessarily know unless you've taken those uh, three years with them. I mean, it's parents, children. I mean, it's a collection of ages. And I just find it shocking that 
the ritual involved everyone getting naked, getting into the water and, um, you know, be, basically being asked those questions three times. I, I just find it shocking. Yeah, well, it's quite different from what we do for sure. So why would it be so important for everybody to get naked into the water? Why not go in clothed? I mean, they're being pretty specific here, so they must have a reason. Well, I can think of, go ahead. Joyce, did you want to say something? Oh, you're muted though, Joyce, so I can't hear you. Juice, can't hear you, Joyce. Now? Yeah. Yeah. The clothes maybe represented baggage and they wanted you to be pure. Yeah. And vulnerable, maybe. Yeah, very vulnerable. And being yeah. newborn like a baby. Newborn, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. That's it. They want you to be a baby. <laughs> Want you to Can I ask a question? One of those paintings, it looked like they were, there were skulls on the bottom of the water. Oh, I didn't notice that. He was sitting on skulls. They all had little two eye holes. I mean, it could be me. The middle middle painting. Oh, it was out. odd. Oh, yeah. And by the way, the words, as a former Anglican, I realized it's the uh, Apostles' Creed that they're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah that one. Yeah. Like, yeah. It they looks are like skulls. They are skulls. Yeah. Is that symbolic of the death? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, this is a modern picture. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not a really old one. But um, yeah, that would be symbolic of the death that they're experiencing. Yeah. And, you know, you heard that in Paul's quote, right? You know, you're dying to your old life. You're being reborn mm -hmm. in Christ. You died. And now because you've come back to life, you are reunited with Christ who was resurrected. Right. So they're really trying to make it so that you personally have become like Jesus Christ by dying and coming back to life. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is that death and rebirth thing also works as a baby being born uh, kind of imagery, right? So you're born out of the water naked, just like you're pulled out mm -hmm. of your, your, your mother, right? So these two images are happening simultaneously. And as I said, like they really did say in the early days, you should be baptized in water deep enough to drown him. Because the, 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 you want to be aware of death. You want to die to your old life. Very explicitly. Um, and then what would happen right after this, they would come out after having said all these vows, they'd be able to put on white vestments, right? So purity and colors, right? Um, oh, and Vicky, just to address your question, in other instructions on this, the deacons who baptized and got into the water with the women would be women. And they'd be off they'd be somewhere separate now the yeah. romans weren't very choosy about being naked around each other so i don't think they'd be shocked the way we would be having a bunch of naked women with a bunch of naked men but the mm -hmm. idea of touching the naked women that you right. Do that with. right good good to know thank you um so right after this because it's easter morning they would be wrapped in uh, white vestments they get anointed with some oil because Christ is the anointed one. That's what the word Christ means, right? The anointed one. So they would be anointed with oil. Um, they don't need to be exercised anymore because they've got the Holy Spirit in them. So they're fine there. And then they would go to church and they had been to church before as initiates, but they've never been allowed to stay to hear, um, to take communion because they were still sullied by all that pagan stuff. And, you know, carrying demons inside them and so forth was the idea. So for the very first time, they would be able to take communion. So first communion and baptism happen on the same day. So it's a very, very big deal. Um, but obviously things changed. And the reason things changed, this whole three-year process changed and the timing changed and everything else. Right, so all of those things was because of this guy, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who in 313 has a vision. It's sort of debated exactly how this works, but he has a vision either of a cross in the sky or a dream. 
and he decides, he prays to the Christian God, if you help me win this battle, then I will convert to Christianity. He wins the battle, he becomes a convert of Christians, and he becomes their benefactor. And as a benefactor, uh, so he makes Christianity popular. Uh, suddenly it's okay to be a Christian. You're no longer being persecuted as long as he's in charge. And as is the way with all uh, things which kings do, whether it's hairdos or clothing styles, suddenly everybody wants to be a Christian. So if everybody wants to be a Christian, then you can't take three years to become a Christian. It'll take way too long. And Christianity is a small religion and suddenly all sorts of people want to do it. So they change the rules. They build buildings like this. Constantine, um, Constantine funded the, the construction of this building in Rome. It's called the Lateran Baptistery. Um, and it was created so crowds of adults could be baptized inside in bulk. Inside, this is what it looks like. Mm. Very, very ornate beautiful. There's all sorts of silver and gold and stuff in it that Constantine donated. And in the center, so you see these eight pillars, right? Mm -hmm. Eight being a magic number among Christians because there are seven days of creation, but Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday, which, you know, was the first day of the week. So in a sense, he was resurrected on the eighth day of the week. So Christians like eights. So here's it. So it means the renewal of the world, the renewal of human beings. So eight columns surround what used to be a pool. So this, this fenced in area used to be an enclosed pool where people could be baptized en masse. It wasn't as deep enough to drown in unless you fell down, but it was deep enough to get lots of people in there. Um, and suddenly uh, there was just no time uh to wait till easter to baptize everybody so they started baptizing people all through the year just because so many people wanted to be baptized now in that in that building which i intend to visit this summer in that building there's a plaque that has uh, the words that would have been spoken in that building while people were baptized and i'll read these out for you um, so, but just listen to it for its um for the kind of imagery and metaphors which they're applying to baptisms and what they think what they think baptism means. So I'll read this part out. A people to be concentrated to the heavens here is born. From a fruitful seed established by waters made fertile by the Spirit. Plunge in, O sinner, to be cleansed by the sacred flow. Whom it receives old, the waves return new. No differences exist among those being reborn, whom one font, one spirit, and one faith make one. By virginal birth, the mother church bears children. Those she conceives by God's breathing, she breathes by this stream. You... Yes. You who wish to be innocent, wash in the bath, whether you are burdened by ancestral sin or your own. This is the fountain of life, which cleanses the whole world. Its origin is Christ's wound. Hope for the heavenly kingdom once you have been reborn in this spring. That happy life does not admit those only once born. Let the, neither the number nor kind of their sins frighten. Anyone reborn in the river will be holy. So what do you make of that? Stephen, there was a line in there, the second uh, slide, about um, you you can't um you're if you could go back to it thank you um that happy life does not admit those only once born um so i, I don't understand what that means well you're being reborn when you get baptized right so, i understand that so but, those who don't get baptized are the once born 
because they were born biologically, but they weren't reborn through baptism. But it says it doesn't admit them. So in other words, you can't, <laughs> right from the get-go, we, what you're implying is that the happy life is once you have been baptized and once you are reborn. Well, it says in the previous sentence, right? It says, hope for the heavenly kingdom once you have been reborn in this spring. So the heavenly kingdom is both on earth and the fellowship with fellow Christians, but also, of course, heaven itself, right? An afterlife. Right. It says that happy life, i.e. the afterlife, does not admit those only once born. Got it. Okay. The afterlife, in a sense. Yeah. So it's saying this is the ticket to the afterlife. Right. Don't get baptized. You're not going to the afterlife. Which is interesting because it doesn't matter how much you've sinned. That doesn't have anything to do with it. Well, you wouldn't, hopefully, you wouldn't it, uh, line up for baptism unless you had repented of your sins and you wanted to, you know, live a new life. Um, this, this isn't meant for people who just want to be social climbers and say, I got the certificate and I'm going to keep murdering and stealing. Right. Uh, Jim? At this point in time, would baptism have more uh, significance than the elements, the sacraments, the uh, communion? Well, you don't get to do that without baptism. So in that sense, yes. But uh, communion is hugely important at this point, for sure. But you're not going to get to do communion unless you get baptized. Don't they normally, wouldn't they normally preach or adhere to the point that uh, accepting the uh, sacrament is part of the, uh, the transformation, the salvation, the redemption? Uh, it is, but you wouldn't be allowed to accept the sacrament unless you'd already gone through this process. Um, you know, it's like, you know, Jesus says at one point, uh, you know, don't go up to the temple to make a sacrifice if you're angry with your brother, right? Fix things up with your brother, and then you can both come up to the temple and make a sacrifice, because otherwise you're just bringing, you know, all of that anger and, and, um, and misanthropy, right, to the temple, and that's not right. They would feel the same way about this. Unless you unloaded all of those sins and your sinning nature, then you have no business getting baptized, nor do you have any business um, taking communion. Uh, Toby? Is marriage a sacrament? Not back then. Pardon? Not back then, no. But now? Um, to, well, is it a sacrament? It is in some Christian denominations. The United Church doesn't consider it a sacrament. We would say that only baptism and uh, communion are sacraments. Um, really, okay. the, the province of Ontario is the one who decides who you get married, right? Not the church. <laughs> hmm. So back well, then, I guess what I guess what I was thinking was, of course, if if you, if if marriage was a sacrament and you haven't been baptized, you can't be married. <laughs> that's uh, there's there's discussions about this in paul's letters right about you know is it okay to marry if uh your partner is still a pagan and he says yes go ahead do it because you might be able to convert them. Uh, so you know christians were in no position to be you know to try and uh set the set the agenda back then because they just weren't bigger they, they weren't big enough so one of the things uh oh bonnie yeah well, I, whoops. Yeah, I was just going to say um, in the Roman Catholic Church, um, I, I believe that you, you still have to be baptized in order to get married. Yes. And every once in a while, like every year, uh, we get requests at Lawrence Park for proof that someone's being baptized so that they can marry a Catholic. Priest will say, I want proof that you were baptized by those Protestant, you know, good for nothings. <laughs> Halfway there. So so suddenly, so in the in the fourth century, thanks to Constantine, tons of people are getting baptized. Tons of people are becoming Christians. Um, and it got e so it got easier, but the meaning of it changed in the fifth century, in the four hundreds. And that was because of this guy. 
and this will actually get to what Linda Anderson was asking about before. Augustine, mm -hmm. yes. Bishop St. Augustine of Hippo uh, from North Africa. Um, he's the father of original sin. He's the one who comes up with this idea of original sin. Mm -hmm. Augustine has a lot to answer for, all things considered. Yes. Um, Augustine um, lived at a very violent time. Uh, he lived, he, he got to watch the Roman Empire fall apart. Um, the, uh, the warring tribes from outside of the Roman Empire started coming deeper and deeper into the empire, sacking the cities, sacking Rome. Um, and the once invincible empire suddenly looked as though it wasn't so invincible. And instead, violence seemed to be everywhere. And the Roman Empire had always been violent, but it'd been violent without having to worry about itself getting beaten up. And now it was getting beaten up too. And when people invaded a city, it was not pretty, right? I mean, it's not pretty now either. You know, what's happening in Gaza is not pretty. What's happening in Ukraine is not pretty. It's awful. Well, they were really awful back then, but with less technology, so it was more hands-on awful. And Augustine got to see all of this uh, and heard about it. And um, he also had, uh, I would say in modern terms, an unhealthy attitude towards his own sexuality where he found the fact that he couldn't control his own sexual desires to be proof that free will was not actually something that existed in human beings. And he traced all of that. Sorry, Jim, did you want to say something? Do you think that in part led him to think about the imposition of original sin? Oh, is no my fault. Oh, absolutely it did. Yes, the fact that he could not control... Um, one part of his body uh, suggested to him that the idea of free will was obviously just an illusion. If, if men had free will, they'd be able to tell themselves when to get erections and it would happen. But that's not the way it works. Therefore, we're at war with ourselves. And where did that war begin? It happened, it began back in the Garden of Eden. And this does have a lot to do with baptism, believe it or not. So can I get three readers? Because we got to go back to Eden. Tell you what, I'll read. I'll, I'll read. You guys have read lots. <laughs> and and <laughs> as Vicky said, this passage is difficult because she has to read it on Sunday. <laughs> now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise that she took up its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her Aaron Denbor. she also gave to her husband with her and he ate then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew what that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves Aaron so that's the text that Augustine makes so much of. He sees the origin of his lack of free will as that particular episode. Um, he reasons that when Adam and Eve disobeyed God's orders in the Garden of Eden, everybody was affected. And his reasoning, I kid you not, is that within Adam's semen, was the seed of all humans who would come after him. Therefore, all of us were physically present in, in the form of our, his seed. Um, as he disobeyed, ergo, we were all guilty of it, and we all, therefore, are born stained by original sin. And in his eyes, it's not just guilt. He's talking about a corruption of our ability to reason a corruption of our capacity for free will. And the reason I had you guys uh, hear that baptismal, those baptismal vows that they did in that baptistery 
is that it doesn't talk about original sin. It's too mm -hmm. early. That was written in the three hundred in the yeah in the three hundreds. We're talking about the four hundreds now. And Augustine right. comes up with this idea, which is totally at odds with the views of Christians for the previous three centuries. Like they did not think this way. They thought that human beings were made in God's image. Therefore, we had free will, which meant that, of course, we were free to sin. We could do that. And the evidence was compelling that we do that often. But we also have the ability to choose to repent, change our minds, and not sin. Okay? Augustine said, no, we don't. We don't have that capacity. That capacity for true free will was corrupted in the Garden of Eden. And everybody born since then has been corrupted by it. Free will is an illusion. And life is chaotic and violent because human beings are corrupt, horrible beings. So, and what that meant was baptism was where you got infused with the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ who forgives sins. So baptism is the way in which that sinful nature, which you were born with, can be tempered and battled. Okay? But that meant that if you didn't get baptized, you had not been cleansed, therefore you were headed to hell. And that applied even to babies. The baby who died without being baptized was going to hell. Now, Augustine said God wouldn't be too rough on the baby, but nonetheless, the baby was still, uh, was still born with original sin in it. Therefore, it could not go to heaven. It could not get eternal life in the heavenly blissful place. It was going to the other place. Okay, I saw a couple hands go up. Laura, and then Vicky, and then Isla. <laughs> okay, Laura. Okay, so he's considered a saint. <laughs> 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 That's correct. <laughs> Where did Laura go? <laughs> oh, she didn't hang up on me for this. <laughs> I just know it. Um, okay, Vicky, you're next until Laura comes back. <clears throat> and you're muted, though. So, okay. Um, thank you. Um, what he does is he condemns anybody who isn't doesn't get baptized. That's what he's done. Mm -hmm. Just thrown everybody away. Yes. And he, he still thinks that human beings, even baptized human beings, still have a corrupted will. Like we still can't think straight. But at least through Jesus Christ, we can be, uh, we can still, we can have access to heaven, but only because of our baptism. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's going to have to be a whole lot of repenting going on for that to happen. But anybody unbaptized, um, a Jew. Chance. Exactly. Rome, That's not a chance. Yeah. They're all doomed. Exactly. Was substitutionary atonement part of this same package that August, St. Augustine brought? Uh, hasn't happened yet. That occurs in the, uh, what, 1100 or so? Oh. Um, so that hasn't happened yet. So Augustine, and the thing is like, you know, this, this is totally at odds with what everybody be, before him thought, but with the Roman empire collapsing and violence everywhere and what seemed to be an unshakable empire suddenly collapsing, the impossible was happening, was happening. This is nine eleven times a thousand. Uh, everybody's looking around going, yeah, we are pretty awful. You know, so this made some kind of sense to them in that context. Uh, Isla, you had your hand up. Where did St. Augustine come from? Hippo. Where was Hippo? Uh, North Africa. Specifically? Uh, I don't know, actually. Jim, do okay. you know? Where is Hippo? Yeah. Uh, where was the first spring revolution? Uh, the... Oh, Tunisia? Uh, Tunisia, yeah. Yeah, so okay. in Tunisia, so North, and North Africa. Oh, yeah, okay. So that's why when babies were ill in childhood, they would rush to get them baptized before they died. Yes, yes. Okay. And, and that actually had a funny consequence. Um, let me just show you. Um, so yeah, Augustine wins the lottery here for uh, Christian theology, and everybody believes this going forward. And what it means is when 
children were born in the Middle Ages, if the midwives thought the child looked the least bit sickly, they would baptize the child themselves. And the that, midwife. Yeah, the midwife would do it. And that was okay uh, because oh. the Catholic Church believed anybody could baptize someone. It's much better to be baptized by a non cleric than not to be baptized at all, considering the stakes. Oh. So a lot of medieval society was actually baptized by women. <laughs> which is a lovely twist. It, there's so little that's good news about this story. At least that's kind of nice. Um, so, uh, and for up until 1200, when you got baptized, um, you would, uh, the baby would get baptized. And if it was happening in a church, and then they'd immediately, like it would happen on a, on a church Sunday, they would immediately give it communion. Like they would have communion that morning. And it would be with wine. <laughs> I guess that's one way to get the child to be quiet. Um, and then and then that stopped in the year 1200 because uh, they came to believe that the wine really, 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 really was the blood of Christ. And there were so many accidents with people spilling wine by mistake and stuff uh, that letting babies anywhere near the wine was a bad idea. So they stopped doing it. Um, still, uh, Babies kept getting baptized. So basically, baptism became something you did to babies, not adults. So in the early Middle Ages, baptism and communion on the same day, that was until about 1200 or so. Then later on, it was baptized, baptism for children, babies. Um, and then you would take communion as an adult. Okay, but there's another twist to this story because of this guy, Martin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so father of Protestantism, uh, he sparks a revolution. He disagrees with all sorts of uh, Catholic practices. And his big, his big argument is that the Catholics have gone way, way offside because they've, made, they've convinced themselves that if you want to get into heaven faster, you can speed things up by buying prayers for yourself, indulgences. Right? You can buy them for yourself as well as other people. And you can say, okay, uh, my wife died. I think she's got some sins she needs to atone for that she never atoned for. Here's some money. Please have the priest pray for the next hundred years for her. And that'll speed up. Uh, that'll reduce the amount of time she's in purgatory and get her into heaven faster. This was a big, big money maker for the church. Like this is how they built cathedrals and stuff. There are lots of money in this. Um, and Martin Luther just calls them out on it, says that's ridiculous. He says that it's just, it's corrupt. It's wrong theologically. It's, uh, there's no, nothing to recommend it. You can't work your way into heaven. Right? And um, this had implications for baptism because Luther believed that no one could earn Christ's saving power by anything they do, right? You can't buy your way into heaven. But you can't buy your way into grace either. You can't do anything to get to deserve Christ's grace. That's not the way it works. Christ's grace is just there. So um, we need to see baptism, Luther said, as a gift. This is something which Christ confers on us. The Holy Spirit is something that Christ confers on us. It's not something that we need to earn. And so I'm just going to read you a small quote by Luther. He said, we must ascribe both inward and outward parts of baptism to God alone. And look upon the person administering it, like the priest, as simply the vicarious instrument of God, by which the Lord sitting in heaven thrusts you under the water with his own hands and promises you forgiveness of your sins, speaking to you upon earth with a human voice by the mouth of his minister. So Luther is really saying in baptism, you are being uh, initiated, you're being given a gift. You're entering a new life because from here on in, once you're baptized, you are one of those who are forgiven by Jesus Christ. And that power of forgiveness lasts your entire lifetime. Of course you will sin again, of course you will. But every time you sin, you can remember, hey, I was baptized. I am capable of being forgiven because God is all forgiving. That's the gift of baptism. Like Luther made it sound like, you know, you should just tattoo it on your chest. I am forgiven. I was baptized. 
And that's a, a kind of a beautiful idea, all things considered. Um, but not everybody agreed with Luther. Some people said, is Laura back? Yeah, Laura's back, good. Some people said, that makes no sense. Babies don't know anything about Christianity. They don't know anything about Jesus. They don't know anything about forgiveness. They know about crying and milk. That's it. <laughs> they don't know anything. So how can they possibly be worthy of, they're not capable of accepting Christ's forgiveness because they don't know anything about Christ. And so the Anabaptists, so th this led to what was called the Anabaptist controversy. The Anabaptists said, and keep in mind, this is all happening, this is happening in the year 1525. So just like what, seven years after Luther, you know, nails this stuff up um, on, the, on the wall. And the Anabaptists say, nope, we should wait until people are adults, like teenagers, once they actually understand the scripture and they understand who Jesus is, then they can say, I am ready to be baptized because I understand what forgiveness means. And so for those guys, and this was happening in Switzerland and England, those guys said, um, anybody who was baptized as a child, it doesn't count. They didn't know what they were doing. Like they didn't know that they were baptized. So we should rebaptize them. And that's what Anabaptist means, to rebaptize. So Were most of the Anabaptists in northern Germany? Yeah. Um, they started off in Switzerland and then it kind of oh, started out. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and so they start rebaptizing people. And uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of sects of this. Um, it was very popular because, you know, on a, on, a, on a certain level, it makes a lot of sense. And it's easier to understand than Luther's position. So here's an old poster of the various types of Anabaptists that were around. So they're all doing it as adults. And they're rebaptizing people. That drives other Protestants just bonkers, just absolutely bonkers, because the implication is that God didn't know what God was doing when they were baptized the first time as babies. And so, uh, in the 1500s, the solution to this problem was to burn the Anabaptists and drown them. A lot of them got drowned because they thought there was some sort of poetic justice. In it. Thousands of Anabaptists were killed for having rebaptized people. They were burned and they were drowned. Um, and it, it was, I mean, it's a dark day in Christianity, of course. Um, but they thought that they, that baptism should be earned. You know, they had to, they had to actually think it through. And so the key question became, do we have to do anything to be forgiven by Christ for our sins, right? Do we have to do anything? The Anabaptists said, yes, we need to understand the faith and agree with it before we can be baptized and accept Christ's forgiveness. So only adult baptism is acceptable. Luther said, no, Christ does all the work to save us. So a baby born into a Christian family can be baptized and saved without knowing anything about Jesus. They can learn about Jesus later, but Christ's grace is so great that it will uh, save you immediately. I'm just looking at the clock. We're getting near nine, so I'm just going to read a, a, a piece from Paul that inspired Luther. Um, it goes like this. This is from Ephesians. Just look for how Paul considers grace, because this inspired Luther. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which he loved us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He raised up, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. For we, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So you see how the stakes of baptism became really, really high. Um, 
because it was basically <clears throat> you need to understand what you're going through to be able to earn baptism and earn the right to do communion and, and, and so forth or Christ's grace is just so overflowing and enormous that it overwhelms anything any human being could actually accomplish. So God is working through ministers and church communities to make that grace manifest. But that grace is everywhere all the time. And if a baby is born and knows nothing about Christianity, but is baptized, that baby has been given the gift of grace. Um, Stephen? Yeah. A quick question. So that sort of dovetails in with um, the Christian science faith, which is actually says you don't have to be baptized. You are automatically just being born. You are born into the grace of God. So that ties in nicely. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, you know, in the United Church, uh, the way we look at it is, you know, every time we do communion, one of the things I say is that this is an open table. And that's, you know, common mm -hmm. across the United Church. Mm -hmm. We don't ask for anybody to be baptized to come up to the communion table. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're saying in that that we think that any human being, anybody with breath, um, has already been, you know, given the gift of grace and, uh, are, and are eligible to come to this table and receive the uh, elements in which the Holy Spirit dwells, right? Because, you know, that's what the epiclesis is when I ask for the Holy Spirit to be in, uh, come upon these elements. So... Mm -hmm. I think most United Church ministers would probably say that, you know, you don't need to be baptized to be saved by Jesus, because if you did, then we couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, I, I, at least liberal uh, United Church ministers would probably say, yeah, the magic of baptism is more about being inducted into a Christian community rather than getting some special sauce, which is going to save you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Although I actually, frankly, really like Luther's approach to this, but um, Isla? Even now, do you have to be baptized to be in a communicants class? To be, sorry? In a communicants class, <clears throat> to be in a, a training to become a United Church member. Uh, yes. Um, you need to be, that, like, that's practically the only thing where there's a United Church. You need to be baptized to become a member of a church. Um, so anytime we have new members, I always ask them, have you been baptized? Because that's the only thing the United Church, you know, actually demands. Um, and if they have it, then you baptize them. Yes. Hmm. Vicki, you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to say, um, when our two older boys took communion at the church, they hadn't been baptized, but they were able to take the instruction, but to be confirmed in the church they were baptized the same day that they received confirmation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so things have changed a lot over time and the Anabaptists didn't completely go away. I mean, they had to stop rebaptizing people and that's still considered a no, no. Um, but they didn't go away. And so and this, this bears on where we're at now. This is what the evolution of baptism looks like. So in the early days, like in the, in the gospel days and acts days, there was adult baptism and no training, right? On the day of Pentecost, thousands of people got baptized with no training whatsoever. They just heard a speech from Peter, said, yes, that sounds good, and they were baptized. And then for the next like 400 years, more or less, it was mostly adults getting baptized. They had this long three-year training. They would be confirmed and have communion on the same time, the same day they were baptized. In the 400s, things started to speed up. 300s and 400s, things started to speed up. Um, and then in the Middle Ages, it was child baptism all the way, um, except frankly, when they were forcibly converting Jews and Muslims, but otherwise it was child baptism all the way. And then in the 1500s, we get this you know, big controversy about child baptism versus adult baptism, which we were just talking about. And, and out of that came child baptism remained the majority kind of baptism for mainline Protestants and Catholics. And of course, we have no problem baptizing adults, but we just can't re-baptize them. And then, but the Anabaptists did uh, lead to uh, a tradition of only baptizing adults and not baptizing babies in the Baptist churches, the Pentecostals, the Mennonites, the Amish, and the Hutterites. Mm. So those denominations who are still with us, obviously, they prefer to baptize people as adults once they understand the faith. So 
we've come a long way and it's and um i guess the my last question would be what do you think is going to happen to baptism next um because i think all of our we've got people from like three or four churches here i suspect we all do baptisms for families we never see again <laughs> right should, should we <clears throat> The debate some ministers won't do it we do um but it, it's obviously it, it's interesting how it's changed right because for a while there it looked like well you have to get your kid baptized because otherwise they can't be a member of church well these families are coming not expecting to be a member of a church right but they're they want their kid to be baptized and when i've spoken to them it's rarely because they have a really hardcore theology about things i think it's mostly just tradition right where grandma wants it to happen my daughter had to get special dispensation to get her child baptized. Uh, but it was strictly out of respect for her mother's face. She hadn't darkened the door of a church. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. Isn't this where the, uh, the difference between uh, christening and baptism? I mean, if you're asking the question for opinion, on where baptism is going in the future and you know where it has been for some time um, if that is a concern of the united church of canada as you say you know well it's it's a sacrament it's, it's one of the two sacraments of baptism and communion and these families are coming and getting their children baptized and you're never seeing them again, then could it be, you know, a, a position taken, you know, we, we, to get, perhaps get the family thinking and to, to say, well, you know, in respect for their, for the desire to have, you know, recognition in some way, so, well, you know, we we'd be happy to to christen uh, your your child as a as you say maybe maybe a uh, an, an introductory um, member of of the of the community. However, if you're looking for something, and we'll and and celebrate the the birth you know we're going to pray upon your child we're going to pray with you we're going to celebrate the birth uh you know your child is born as a child of god by the grace of god and our christian community is going to celebrate that with you and your child will be christened however if you want to really if you want it to be official well please respect these are the sacraments of the United Church of Canada, and we'd be happy to have, you know, I guess, I guess, uh, as I as I as I catch myself speaking, I guess that's the difference between uh, perhaps the uh, the argument between child baptism and and uh, and, and adult baptism. Um, but I, I, I and thank you, you know, Luther. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i guess the united church because it's sort of on the ropes uh in the sense of you know uh, declining um numbers and stuff most churches will say yeah we'll baptize anybody because we'd like this church to grow and you know if there are no more babies getting baptized then presumably this faith is over i don't think that's true i think people just come to faith later in life but uh <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, it's kind of up to individual ministers. They can say, listen, if I'm never going to see you again, why am I giving 20 minutes of this service to you? Um, whereas others may say, you know what, it, you never know what, what might come of it. You know? Exactly. I think so. That's why you should do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a lovely liturgical moment in the service. Yes. I feel as if it's sort of a promise that you will try and keep Christ teaching with the child and help them along in that direction. Vicki? I was wondering, Andrew's comments made me wonder whether, just like you have communion classes for 
adults. You can't have communion classes for infants, but you could have you could have meetings with the parents. And what has become of the tradition of the godparent? Because there was a role for a godparent, and I don't know whether it's just titular now and honorary rather than functional. Yeah, I mean, the godparent was supposed to be the person outside of your family who would make sure that you got a proper Christian education, right? So if the parents weren't doing it, the godparent would make sure that it happened. Unfortunately, most of the people who want to get baptized, want their kid to get baptized, aren't particularly Christian themselves and aren't really interested in raising their kid as a Christian. Mm -hmm. They just want to get baptized. Mm -hmm. I mean, my... And that they don't understand then the meaning of baptism, do they? Right. Yeah, and I and I meet with them, and and the tricky thing is, as as powerful as Luther's sentiment of this is, uh, if we say unless your kids baptized, they're going to hell, which I never say, right? Yeah. It's really well, so you don't really need to get baptized, right? And that's true. You don't really need to get baptized because we think that Christ came to save all of humanity, which includes Muslims and Hindus and and atheists and everybody. Mm -hmm. right? So. Baptism, I think we're now at the point where baptism is a more intentional step, right? Like, oh, I think I want to raise my kid in the Christian tradition. The problem is that it's kind of hard to say no to people who want to get their kid baptized when you know that they're not, they're not going to stick around. You know, So it's a bit of a dilemma. Um, I mean, baptisms are way, way down. So this is not something which is, you know, tracking back up on another level. Uh, Laura? Oh, you're muted, Laura. Last I heard, in order to attend the Roman Catholic schools, you have to have been baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, which makes sense. Although, really? Well, that's interesting, because that's not always true. Yeah. In yeah. France, in, in, yeah, it's in France. In France, a really funny thing happened. The French government's been pushing really, really hard, right? That um, uh, public, uh, any government um, office, including schools, shall not have any religious aspect, right? So schooling has to be completely secular. Teachers can't wear crosses around their necks or hijabs or anything like that, right? So ironically, it's been the Catholic private schools mm -hmm. who have become a haven for Muslim students who are allowed to wear their hijabs. Mm -hmm. this has happened in nice apparently there's a bunch of catholic yeah. private schools who've got lots of muslim students in them because they're allowed to be themselves there <laughs> way back i found myself working in Southside chicago in the ghetto and uh many of the black families sent their kids to catholic schools because they were more disciplined and uh, safer yeah. I have a Jewish friend who sent his kid to a Catholic school because the morals are good. You know, the education system's good. Um, it's a private school, but yeah. Yeah, you don't need to be baptized uh, Roman Catholic to attend a Canadian private Roman Catholic school. I can't speak to public school system, but it's not the case for uh, private schools. Oh, is it not? I, and I don't think public schools now, because the government has opened it up to whomever. So I don't it think may, it, it may be it may be it, it, it also I don't want to speak for all the schools. You know, it may be subjective, uh, depending on the the bylaws of the board of directors of, of a certain private school and yeah. their charter. But mm -hmm. um, but 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 I, I, I know of at least one where. That's <laughs> because I have extended family members whose children go there and they, and they really enjoy it, but they're not, but they're not, uh, they're, they're, they're not practicing Catholics. They just like, like your friend, Stephen, they, they, they chose it because it had a good reputation and they, the kids seem to be thriving as well. And they have good morals and a good structure and good education. Actually, my brother was an Anglican minister, and when they lived in Quebec, his they ended up sending his daughter to the French Catholic school because it had higher academic standards. The Anglophone school, um, she got bored, so she ended. So the Anglican minister's daughter was at the Catholic church uh, school across the street. Yeah. <laughs> well, folks, that brings me to the Thank end you. of my content, and it's nine o'clock. Yeah, 
little thank bit. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. Oh, very, thank you. Very thank you. Thank before you log off, though, before you log off, um, so here's my proposal for the Bible for Busy People in February. Okay. Ah. So February, weirdly, this year, uh, Valentine's Day is the same day as Ash Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh -huh. in a while. Same day as what? Ash, Ash Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> Ash Wednesday. So oh, that's yeah. kind of contradictory. Yeah. Lent <laughs> begins when Valentine's Day is happening. <laughs> Come to our Ash Wednesday good. service and then go out for a date. I don't know how you make it. I know. So, <laughs> but I thought that um, uh, given the success of the uh, daily emails from the book of Job that I did in the summer, mm -hmm. I thought that I would do a short one of that. And we could do uh, the Song of Songs. For the first two weeks of February, I would send you daily emails of the Song of Songs because it's quite short. Oh, and it's, mm -hmm. it's the Bible's love poem, right? It's gorgeous mm -hmm. poetry. Yeah. Um, and then we could get together, I think the dates are February 20th and 23rd, um, uh, where we could actually talk about it. Um, so you get daily emails for the first two weeks of February, and then a, kind of a week off, and then we would get um, together to talk about the meaning of the Song of Songs. Why is this wildly erotic poem in the Bible? Yeah, there are some R-rated portions, aren't there? Yeah. <laughs> You guys are adults. Yeah. It'll be okay. <laughs> That's right. You read that during sermons. So oh, did you say it's the 20th and the 23rd? Uh, the dates? Let me see. Is it Wednesday and, Wednesday and Friday or Tuesday and Friday? Uh, just give me a second. To be determined. Uh, I think it is Tuesday and Friday. So okay. the 20th and the 23rd. Tuesday and Friday, yeah. And, and one of the things which will make it interesting is that um, it's happening during Black History Month. And if you know the Song of Songs, one of the first things the bride to be says is, I am black and I am beautiful. So mm. lots to discuss in that one. Wow. Uh, Jim? Stephen, uh, a Jewish friend, we, we talk about uh, the Torah and other things, but the sacrifice or the binding of Isaac huh? seems to be a, a, a fascinating story and uh and how it what it led to with sarah and other complex you know downstream complications uh, would you ever consider having a yeah. go at that yeah sure <laughs> uh yeah sure okay i think that's an interesting idea yeah because it's certainly being controversial all the way through um yes history i would need to do a little more research on that because major philosophers have written about it too right I think mm -hmm. guard talked about it. That's right. right. And and the Muslims believe the um um oh I can't remember the the name of the other son is is oh the Ishmael Ishmael yes that 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 it wasn't Isaac it was Ishmael who was um supposed to be um sacrificed. Oh, oh really? Yes. Yeah. Because Ishmael's their guy, right? Right, right, right. Hmm. I have a simplistic comment. Huh? I have a simplistic comment. I would hope, this is my simplistic view, that people who, Christians who get their children's baptized um, are basically, from my point of view, trying to make some commitment to raise their children with a Christian traditional background, with some religious um, philosophy that I think is strongly lacking now in the public school system. Yeah. Mm. Here, here. That's a parent by parent question, isn't it? Because <laughs> we can't mandate it. Um, no, but I, I think of it as being the parent making a commitment to try to teach their child some re Christian religious values that, that don't seem to, that I believe are disappearing out of the, uh, Public school system. Yeah, yeah. that is that is Pretty part of the vows. I mean, explicitly part of the vows uh, is that you know, do you promise to raise this child to yeah. know yeah. the ways of Christ? Mm -hmm. Right. Isla, I have one final question. Was not Constantine's mother the Christian? Yes, she became a Christian, oh. and she oh, she, after the she, fact, did, didn't she influence him, or Very he influenced her? Okay, good. I just. Yes, very, very much. By the way, Stephen, wasn't Constantine also a god? I don't know if he was deified. I, I just don't know. He shouldn't have been. Um, and he was baptized on his deathbed, so it would be really bad for him to deify him. 
<laughs> Something to look into. All right. Well, we Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thanks for joining Thank me. Thank you. Thanks so, so much.